This is the uh, solution guide to uh, exam two for MSE 201 spring 2019. So the first problem is a phase diagram problem. And uh, it is very similar, if not uh, you know, bordering on identical to the um, quiz three we had. We had you know, exactly the same phase diagram and everything. So let's look at this. Uh, just going through it quickly, because the, the details, you can always go back and look at the solution to quiz three. So we've got uh, nickel aluminum. We have 40 atomic percent nickel at 800 degrees C. What are the phases present in the, their compositions? 40 atomic percent. This is atomic percent nickel. 40, 800 degrees C. So we'll draw a vertical line. And horizontal line. So this is where we're at. We have aluminum. That is a uh, very thin slice here. We have Al3 and I. That makes this a two-phase region. Al plus Al3 and I. This is a single phase region. That makes this a two phase region. And you can also think that we have a single phase line compound, which makes this a two phase region. So that's Al3Ni plus Al3Ni2. So that's a single phase region. Being in a single phase region means that only one phase is present. And that one phrase is Al3Ni. The composition of Al3Ni is given by the composition of the system. So F Al3Ni, sorry, Ni2, Ni2 equals 100%. And the phase composition X Ni Al. 3 and I 2 is equal to 40 atomic percent nickel. Or I guess the nickel's already in the uh, subscript here. Okay, next question. Same system, 80 atomic percent nickel, 1200C. Atomic percent nickel, 80%, 1,200. So that's where we're at. I'll change colors to make this easier to see. Uh, it's clearly marked a two-phase region. One of the phases is gamma, which is uh, our nickel-rich phase. The other is marked gamma prime, which is ALNI3, that little slice. Uh, so let's uh, mark out the phase composition by looking at the solubility limits. So let's draw a vertical line down. So that is around, let's call it around 75. And we'll draw a vertical line down here. And that's, I'm gonna call that around 84. So our phase compositions, call this uh, X N I of gamma. So 
Gamma's on this side is 84 atomic percent nickel. And X and I gamma prime, which is that side is 75. Okay, phase is present. So let's, so we've got uh, 84, 75, and 80. 84 minus 80 over 84 minus 75 is equal to 4 over 9 is equal to 0 0.44. So 84 minus 80, that is uh, that distance. And we know that the inverse lever rule tells us that that distance tells us about the phase fraction of that, which is our gamma prime. So that is F gamma prime. So F gamma is equal to one minus F gamma prime is equal to 0 0.55. So F gamma equals 0 0.55. And F gamma prime is equal to 0 0.44. And what is the maximum solubility of nickel in aluminum? So basically we're saying that if we come over here, we start at, and this is at, uh, at uh, 600 Celsius. So that's 600. If I'm over here and I start out with 100% aluminum or zero nickel, because this is in nickel, and I start adding nickel, at what point do I uh, precipitate out a second phase? And that second phase is gonna be Al3Ni. Well, it's very small. And I pretty much took any answer that is less than 1% because it's just such a, a, such a thin sliver. So this is solution to problem one. Now let's get problems two and three. Problems two and three. <clears throat> problem two, this is uh, one of those uh, integral problems. And again, you've seen this on, uh, I guess this was quiz number two, and I had a video showing how to solve this uh, in the video. I actually wrote out the uh, the, the manson coffin equation fully. Uh, and this one, I actually substituted the values in, which is supposed to make this easier. We're talking about the toughness. So in stress strain terms, we've got something that looks like this. First thing we identify is we identify the uh, failure point. So substituting in E at 225 times 10 to the 6. And, and why am I doing it in this fashion? I'm doing it in this fashion because uh, this is in make Pascal. And all of our equations are in base units. That's the, the best assumption. And in fact, uh, even if they're, they're not, it's something that's really handy to, to work with. Uh, and I, I recognize that when I, I gave this equation, I did not uh, specify the, the units. So when I graded, I, I didn't uh, take off for using the, the, the wrong units here. But this is the, the intention here. So if we, if we put this in, that is 0 0.028 three, and I, I chose to go out to three sig figs. So now we have that, we can identify the area inside this rectangle. So 
So inside the rectangle, it is 2, 2, 5 times 10 to the 6th multiplied by 0 0.0283, which is equal to 6.3. 7 times 10 to the 6th, and that's in units of Pascal. Now, ultimately, we want the area under the stress-strain curve, but we have an expression of strain in terms of stress. So basically, we have our plot turned sideways. So we integrate that uh, strain we're going to get the area above. So I'm going to call this upper. is equal to the integral from 0 to 2, 2, 5 times 10 to the 6th of e sigma d sigma Substituting in our value for the, the function, we get 1.14 times 10 to the sixth Pascal. So now, for us to identify the area under the curve, which is our toughness, We take the triangle, the rectangle, minus upper, and we've got both those values. So that gives us an answer of 5.23 megapascal. Problem three. Uh, this is kind of a neat little problem. Uh, that is our stress strain curve. This is a little inset that's showing kind of the zoom in of uh, the front here. Which of these curves has the highest uh, ultimate tensile strength? So that's going to be the one that has the highest stress ever. And that is A, which is the most ductile. So which one uh, deforms the most? D. Which one's the most brittle? Well, brittle is the inverse of ductile. Which one deforms the least? That's E. So in fact, E breaks really early. Uh, so I'm going to skip this for a second here. Uh, which one has the lowest elastic modulus? The elastic modulus is the slope. So we look at that, the one with the lowest elastic modulus is here. That is C. And what is the yield strength of the specimen uh, A? So to do that, you take the yield strength. This is not the proportionality limit, but the yield strength. And the yield strength is defined at the 0 0.002 strain. You draw a line parallel to the elastic range and draw horizontal over and that is around MPA. Right, we have units that make a Pascal. Now lastly the question is you know, which is the toughest? Uh, and, you know, that has to do with the area under the curve. And if you look at these, well, you think, how do you estimate that? Well, the way that I estimated it was I said, well, let's uh, just say they're approximately rectangular. So I could, I could have one, which is kind of like this. And I thought that this might be one of ours. So if I take, uh, and I call that 
1700 megapascal multiplied by, uh, and I call that a 0 0.15, 0 0.15. That gives us a, a toughness of approximately 255 megapascal. And then I thought, well, the only thing that's even in close contention would be uh, D. And D is around uh, 250 megapascal multiplied by uh, 0. Point, and I call this 43, 0. 0.43, which gives us around 107. So this material is tougher. A. So this is the solution to uh, problem three and the solution to problem two. Okay, problem four. Problem four, you got uh, the eutectoid temperature and this is in Celsius and this is a uh, time in uh, uh, seconds and uh, you got the eutectoid temperature. We quench to 600 C. We then hold it for five seconds. So that's going to be said something around here. I mean, I, I know this is a log scale, but it, it's it's uh, not a terrible approximation. And again, you know, I'm really trying to just show that you've got the right right general methods for working with this. Hold it. Get to that point. So at that point, it looks as though we have around 50% uh, P and 50% A. So 50% perlite, 50% austenite. So F perlite equals 0 0.5. F austenite is equal to 0 0.5. Okay, and then it says that uh, we quench it again to uh, 400. And then we hold it for 10 seconds. And that looks like, uh, to me, uh, so I'm calling this around 25% completion. I, I said this was around 50% completion. So if I take 25% completion, uh, the perlite remains as I quench it. So I still have FP equals 0 0.5. Uh, and now the residual austenite, 25% of it, turns into B or bayonite. So 25% of 50% is 12.5%. FB is equal to 0 0.125, which means the residual is austenite. FA equals 0 0.375. And then we quench it down to room temperature. It goes through as Martin City transition. The rest of the austenite transforms, leaving the same perlite from above, the same bayonite from above. And now the austenite has turned into martensite. And there are there is no uh, austenite left. So that's the solution to problem four. Problem five. Problem five is, is really kind of a, a math problem. Basically, you're going to be transforming a, an equation. Uh, 
we have our our uh, Averami equation. 1 minus x negative k t to the n. Well, our uh, uh, value for n is given. And we have the fraction crystallization, so that's our y, and we're given the time t. So the goal is to find k. Transforming this equation, we have k is equal to the natural log 1 minus y over t to the n. And you're substituting in for y, t, and n. We get k is equal to negative 3.57 times 10 to the negative 3 minutes to the negative 5. And we need units of minutes raised to the negative 5 because, uh, uh, well, because that's what the units come out as. And that's one of those kind of weird things about dealing with uh, uh, the type of exponentials that are empirical relations. If you have an empirical relationship, you wind up with units which are sometimes a little bit funky. The, the interior of this exponential has to be uh, unitless. And to make it that, that has to be inverse uh, minute to the n. OK. So k is negative 3.57 times 10 to the minus 11 minutes to the negative 5. Uh, and again, this k is not necessarily a meaningful value. It's just a fitting parameter that gives us a curve with the right shape. So the next question is uh, determine the rate of the recrystallization. So we have that the uh, rate is equal to uh, the time for 50% crystallization raised to the in inverse. And that gives us uh, units of uh, 1 over minutes. So the rate is going to be a 1 over time. Uh, so we'll take this equation and, and transform it, moving the t over and the k over. Here we have t to 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 is going to be the value now for y is equal to natural log 1 minus 0 0.5 divided by k, which is negative 3.5. 5, 7 times 10 to the negative 11 raised to the 1 fifth. And that solves our, our unit problem. Uh, and that gives us a value of 1, 1, 4 minutes. Taking the inverse of that, eight point seven seven times 10 to the minus 3 inverse minutes. So that's the solution to problem 5. Problem 6. OK, problem 6 uh, this is our fatigue problem. Our fatigue problem, and I, I uh, Pointing out this is our cycles to failure. This is our uh, uh, 1 times 10 to the uh, 7 cycles. Uh, these units are in MPA. And this was our, uh, our magnesium curve. So basically, 100 MPA is the... Uh, is the, the uh, uh, point where uh, the fatigue limit occurs. And which means that if we want to figure out what the maximum applied stress is, is going to be equal to 
100 MPA divided by our safety factor 2.540 MPA. So the resulting maximum allowed stress is 40 megapascal. And going above that, then you're no longer uh, within the uh, requisite safety factor uh, defined for this particular problem. So we've got that. And we have that the max stress is equal to the applied force divided by the area. The applied force is 10 kilonewtons. That's 10 times 10 to the 3 uh, newtons divided by pi r squared, the area of a cylindrical bar. And this, I'm going to call this uh, rm, is the minimum allowed uh, area. If you get smaller than that, then the force constant, but the area diminishes and we go over our max allowed stress. So taking this, uh, we get Rm is equal to 10 times 10 to the 3 divided by pi um, and then we use our stress in here so this is 40 times 10 to the 6 so our 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 3 we're going to get some cancellation there raised to the 1 half because we have a r squared and solving that we get uh, Rm is equal to 8.92 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. So that's millimeters, 8.93 millimeters. We're asking for the diameter, which is 2 times uh, R. So 2 is equal to... 17.8 millimeters. Okay. Now, problem seven is our um, is our uh, fracture mechanics problem, uh, where we're given the surface energy, we're given the Young's modulus, uh, we're given that a fracture initiates, so this is our uh, critical stress for the beginning of cracking. And from that we have our critical stress is equal to 2e gamma over pi a to the one half. So that's our, our equation for the uh, 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 sample that looks, again, let me draw this. This is all focused on a uh, thick specimen with a through crack with size A. Okay, so we take that and we transform that to get a one is equal to two e gamma over pi sigma squared. A one is equal to two times 65 times 10 to the nine. That's because we have gigapascal times 350 times 10 to the minus 3, because it's millijoule, 
divided by pi 12 times 10 to the 6 squared. The uh, stress for cracking it is 12 megapascal, so you've got 10 to the 6th. And this gives us a, slaw, a flaw size of 101 micrometers. That's 101 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, so that's the first problem. And the next problem is, uh, change colors here, uh, how much surface must be removed to survive an applied stress of 24 megapascal? Okay, so basically we're saying, how big of a crack do we need or can we have and it to survive that stress? So let's say A2 is equal to 2, and we're going to use the same equation, except now we've changed the uh, stress in the denominator. So it's 2 times 65 times 10 to the 9 times 350 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by pi 24 times 10 to the 6 squared. A2 is equal to 25.1 micrometers. So basically we're saying that if I take this surface and I polish it to remove this, leaving a smaller crack, the amount of surface I have to take off so that this crack is 25 micrometers, A1 minus A2 is equal to 75. 75 micrometers. Okay. So this is the solution to uh, problem seven. And now lastly, we have the uh, true-false statements. Okay, true. The strength of the material is increased by the addition of small hard precipitates due to dislocation pinning. And there's also dislocation bowing, but dislocation pinning is uh, one strengthening mechanism. False. In the case of fatigue testing, if the sample is always under compressive loading, the stress ratio is negative. Well, if it's always under uh, compressive, then the top and the bottom are both negative, giving you a positive stress ratio. Diffusion in grain boundaries typically begins at temperatures that are lower than diffusion through the bulk grains. And that's because in the grain boundaries, we've got bigger holes, which means the activation energy for hopping is lower. And if the activation is lower, then that means that lower temperatures for allow for diffusion through the grain boundaries. Um, true, fracture toughness is a material specific prob property. You can look up tables of these for particular materials. False, the theory of plasticity is well understood. It is not well understood. We, we're making a lot of progress, but there are still many things we don't understand. Uh, this question about creep, uh, true or false, they're, they're both okay. I, I put this on just kind of to acknowledge the fact that uh, I didn't have time to have any creep questions on the exam, so I, I put that in. Uh, and it's also you know one free point, I guess. Uh, ductile to brittle transitions are less common in FCC. They're much more common in BCC, and that's because BCC have fewer slip systems that are available. And... Uh, FCC is, is really the one of the more ductile crystal structures that we have. If you want to think about it, think uh, gold is, is FCC, copper is FCC. Uh, these are the materials that you know we use for uh, wiring because both they're electrically conductive and they are uh, extremely ductile and we can work with them. Uh, resilience. Is capacity for a material to absorb energy 
during elastic deformation. Toughness is both elastic and plastic. Uh, false. Critically resolved shear stress depends only on the geometry and is independent of the material. Now, again, it, it is a material-dependent property. Um, highly anisotropic crystals depend strongly on the direction of the loading. That's kind of the whole isotropic versus anisotropic. The anisotropic is saying that it is uh, dependent on direct direction. Um, typically, the hardness of a material increases with the reduction of grain size. It's true. Uh, false. Fatigue cracks typically nucleate at the interior of the part away from the surfaces and defects. Uh, fatigue typically originates at either inclusions, like uh, voids or defects that have been introduced during the, the casting process, or from a surface where you have a stress concentrator. It's the stress concentrator, whether that stress concentrator is a, a pre-existing crack or a uh, geometric factor or a uh, uh, defect, uh, that's where we see fatigue initiating. Um, shot ping the surface, uh, metal hardens it due to the introduction of cracks or stresses. Well, can you ever imagine adding cracks in order to increase the hardness? No. It introduces stresses. The stresses are compressive in nature and uh, blunt crack tips. Um, in ductile materials, crack tips blunt as they pass through due to dislocation of motion. You can think, well, are there dislocations in brittle materials? No, so that's out. But you can also think that in ductile materials, that's where you have dislocations. And when you, in the, when, as a crack is propagating, you're going to see the crack tip opening up a little bit and, and rounding out. So we know that the, uh, uh, the stress concentrator effect depends on the radius of curvature of a crack tip. So a very fine crack has a much stronger stress uh, amplitude than a, a, a rounded one. Uh, false. Most metals have a negative Poisson ratio. Uh, most metals, most materials in general have a positive po Poisson ratio. There's a few weird materials like cork and there are some ceramics also that have uh, negative Poisson ratios that they've been designed so that the atomic structure has kind of hinge structures. So as you pull on it, uh, the uh, uh, cross-section uh, enlarges. Dislocation pileups at the grain boundaries enable transgranular dislocation motion. Uh, what happens is as you get dislocations that pile up, uh, the stress uh, increases on the neighboring grains, and that's what uh, enables uh, dislocations to jump across a grain boundary. And you know, it's not even that the dislocations jump, it's that the stress from the dislocations at the boundary uh, result in new dislocations forming. So it, it enables uh, di dislocation motion that cuts across materials or cuts across grains. Uh, precipitation hardening is inversely proportional to the spacing between the precipitates. Uh, so it's directly proportional to the density, but as I increase the density, I'm basically creating a shorter distance between those precipitates. Um, let's see, bulk and elastic modulus tend to decrease with increasing temperature. Uh, think of common materials you work with. Think of, uh, you know, bread dough or think of, you know, molding clay. Uh, as you increase or decrease the temperature, you'll see uh, softening as you increase the temperature. Uh, false. On a phase diagram, two single phase regions can never, and you saw I put it in italics there, be adjacent. Uh, and that's not true because we have congruent melting points. So that's kind of one of those uh, keywords never that you need to think about very carefully. And lastly, in the case of solidification, the requisite undercooling is always smaller for heterogeneous nucleation than homogeneous. And that's because 
in heterogeneous nucleation, uh, there's going to be energy that comes from the elimination of the mold uh, liquid surface area. So that is the uh, solution to the last problem on uh, exam two for MSC 201 spring 2019.